Hello everyone, welcome to The Path of Me. I'm your host, Wendy Hutchinson, and I have the lovely Kelly Chevalier with me today. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you so much. She has been, um, boy, she's been busy. She sent me her resume and I was like, wow, this is gonna, this, we might need a, more than an hour to uh, <laughs> cover all of this. But she has had an incredible career. Um, Retired U.S. Army major. She is the owner of Ward Slay Creative Agency. She's published a book, um, Get Up, Get Dressed, Get Out. She's a motivational speaker. Um, and she's running, she was running for Congress. That, that just, um, that was a huge undertaking. And she just kind of withdrew, I think, this morning, right? So I can't yeah. wait to talk about that journey as well. But Kelly, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I'm so excited to deep dive here. Um, I guess we should just kind of start at the beginning. What Ooh. inspired you, first of all? Did you did you get your master's? You also have a master's. I do. Science. Did you do that before or after your Army uh, career? Um, I started my master's degree when I was stationed at Okinawa, Japan. So, um, yeah, I started and finished it while I was on active duty status. I don't know if you slept at all during your lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how you fit all this stuff in. There was not a lot of sleep, which was, is, it's kind of interesting because in the book, um, Get Up, Get Dressed, Get Out, I write about how God wakes me up at 4 a.m. every morning, whether I like it or not. <laughs> well, you have a lot of productive hours in your day then. A lot. We're and that, that little uh, comment, you know, that little, um, that old commercial that was like, um, army be all you can be. We do more before 6 a.m. than most people do all day. Like that that's is no the joke. truth. That, that's, that's the truth. Joke, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's incredible. Incredible. What inspired you to join the military? Mm. And the army in particular? <laughs> this is, this is funny because you know, a lot of people join the army for many, many reasons. For me, I did not want to have to move back into my mom's house and under her rules. Wow, <laughs> so you're taking a stand. I was, um, I've always been a very adventurous person, I believe, in living a life um, like a story worth telling. And I've never shied away from an adventure. So, uh, when I got the opportunity to join the Army, I really was thinking, you know what, I can't go backwards in my life. I felt like if I moved back in with my mom and, you know, moved back into my little room, because I had already gone to college by this time, and um, I was flunking out of pharmacy school. <laughs> and so, That wasn't your path. <laughs> yeah, that was like not where I was supposed to be because literally um, I later majored in English because there's no numbers. Like that's... There you go. And so, um, so I really was like, you know what? I want to, t I want to move forward. I want to do something adventurous. I want to try something that everybody's telling me I can't do. And I kind of been doing that ever since. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're a busy lady. What, what's so cool. So you ended up in Okinawa and you, um, you had so many opportunities open to you as a part of that military army career. Oh you were able to be a public affairs officer for one star, two star, three star generals. I mean, what an incredible opportunity that must have been to work so closely with people um, in that position. Let me tell you, um, the best thing about being able to work at that level is all the lessons that you learn. Most people never get to be in the room when these kinds of decisions are being made about um, you know, national defense or decisions being made about uh, you know, how we're going to move people logistically or you know, these are some major decisions and I got an opportunity to see not just the result of those decisions but the politics of it, you know, um, how, they're, how they negotiate um, basically human lives and resources. And, and, and that's, that's a big deal. Um, most people, especially at, at my age and rank at the time, never get to see the inside of that kind of um, behavior. You must have learned so much 
about negotiating negotiating compromise. leadership oh my gosh leadership. so much about compromise and i learned a lot about um it just the way humans think about what they value most what they want most um it's interesting because a lot of times what people say they want most is not in alignment with their actions yeah. and if you can kind of um, see people for what they really want instead of maybe what they're doing on the outside, you can get a lot further. So it takes a listening of people that uh, takes some practice. It's not just what people say all the time. You, you have a huge opportunity to be an yeah. observer. Yes. Which is really cool. And I can tell by your master's in behavioral science that that was kind of, that probably came naturally to you Yeah. yeah. in your life. Yeah, I think that I have a, a gift for being able to hear people. Um, I do this exercise with my clients where they, they take this infinity symbol, you know, just like an eight laying on its side. It, they take this infinity symbol and I give them very minimal directions and I'll say, I want you to trace this um, symbol as many times as you can until I say stop. And that's, that's all I say, nothing else. And then when I finally say, say stop, I ask them, so what were you thinking? And their answers will really reveal to both of us what their whole life is about, their entire life. Because I, I believe you know, how you do one thing is how you do everything. And when given a very um, minimal amount of instructions, people react differently. And guess what? Life does not come with instructions. We just get a little bit out of time. And so how you treat that one thing is um, overwhelmingly how you treat the whole rest of your life. That's really, that's really powerful. It is. It tells us a lot. And then once you know that, you know how to move forward with someone. You know whether or not this is someone who appreciates um, aesthetic or this is someone who appreciates time or they value um, check checklists or whatever that is. You find out more about them and Everybody you know differently. Yes, you know how to operate within their um, unique parameters. Amazing, amazing. You were able to um, also get involved in service to others by getting involved in a nonprofit organization. Um, I think. It was dedicated to females with post-traumatic stress. Did that occur after your military career or was that happening yes. while you were in active duty? So that was after my military career. Um, my career in the military ended abruptly um, when a car bomb exploded and my spine was fractured. I was medically discharged from the military. So this wasn't something I had planned. Wow. How old were you <laughs> when that happened? 30... Two, Were you in the car? Were you just in the vicinity? Oh. I was in a vehicle that was in the blast radius. So had I been a few minutes earlier, I would have been like close enough where I wouldn't be here today to speak to wow. you. So um, that experience caused me to really evaluate my life and um, among many other things, but just to appreciate what I have and then start thinking about what I can do for others because our life is so short. That must have been so, um, you know, you can't go through an experience like that, especially a car bomb, so, so traumatic, so unexpected and not be changed. No, you can't. It changed you everything in your life. It, it changed your trajectory of your career. Yes. Your healing recovery, what did that look like physically yes. and emotionally and mentally? And then also, like you said, I think you, you come out on the other side of these tragedies, either in a deep space of gratitude and wanting to create change mm -hmm. or in a real victim mindset. I think it That's goes two the ways, key. Right? That is the key. And I think that for everyone who, I can't say for everyone, for me, I started out as a victim. 
that was the mentality that I was in. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening to me. That's it's very, a you know, response. Yeah. And yeah. you're in pain and you're wounded and, and it's hard. And there were so many mm-hmm. questions that weren't being answered. And my future was so uncertain. And I had a family who depended on me. And so I, I was looking for other organizations who I had heard help veterans in my situation. But when I called on them, I got no help, like no help. And I vowed in that moment, that's, that was the turning point. It was like, okay, so basically my mission has just shifted. And now my mission is to make sure that no woman who honorably serves is kicked out of the military and has no idea what she's going to do next. That is the, is the worst feeling. It is this sinking feeling that if you're not careful, um, turns into PTSD. And if you're not very careful, um, turns into that, that statistic, that 22 a day statistic of veterans committing suicide. And that's what I wanted to stop. That's incredible that you had that awareness. I think whenever you go through a trauma, the first response is a fear response. Yeah. And it's normal. It's normal to be angry. You're suffering physically. You're in shock emotionally. Your life is, is turned upside down. There's so much that's happening. And what we don't see in those moments, in those deep trauma moments, is that there's something being gifted at the same time. That's right. Until much later, when you look back and you go, wow, if I had not been a victim of that car bomb, this, that, or the other would not have happened. And I wouldn't be the woman standing here today, running for Congress of all things. Yes. You know, making those types of decisions, leadership decisions, impactful decisions for humanity, but something traumatic had to spark that. Absolutely. Um, It's a very stoic approach to life that, you know, that obstacle is the way that that tragedy, that trauma is the way to um, your purpose. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I subscribe to it wholeheartedly because that's what the book is all about. Get up, get dressed, get out. It's about me waking up at 4 a.m. every morning and going, okay, well, what am I supposed to do now? Like, I can barely well, walk. How long were you in the military prior to that? How, how long had your service term been prior to that um, car bomb? Um, I had been, I had served 15 years when the, when the uh, bomb yeah. exploded. You I had were, served 15 years. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> military woman. And I, absolutely. I go back real quick before we get too far removed, but mm-hmm. what was your big takeaway from being in the situation room with those generals making those decisions? How did that impact you as a person, that experience? Um, I think the biggest thing was understanding leadership and the different types of leadership. Um, so anyone can be a leader, right? You know, there's that, like, that question, are you born a leader or are you made a leader? Well, all leaders are born, okay? Right. <laughs> <We're> all, <laughs> everybody's well, born. You're yeah. <laughs> So you see these different types of leaders and what I learned was what type of leader I wanted to be. That's, mm-hmm. that's what I learned. And that's the thing that I've taken into my journey to running for Congress or starting a nonprofit or running a business. It's what kind of leader do I want to be? And mm-hmm. I wanted to be the type of leader that gives without demanding something in return that just serves, like is a service to others. That's true service. Yeah. Service without an agenda. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think we are are aligned in that, both of us. It's just beautiful. So after you healed, how long was your healing process? Three years total. Oh my gosh. Well, yeah. I mean, if you include all of the therapy and everything, um, three years total. back home stateside or were you... Oh my gosh, my my mom made certain of that. <laughs> my mom was like, "You gonna bring my baby home? I need to lay eyes on my child." Gosh. And uh, uh, fortunately, Fort Sam Houston is um, not far from 
where I live in Houston. So I was able to get most of my early care there. But um, my mom fought to be able to interview my primary doctor. And so the surgery actually happened at Memorial Hospital in Houston, Texas. That's, that is the mama's love. That is a fight for love. you. <laughs> that was her <laughs> determination. I see where you get your drive. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. How beautiful though that she was able to be here and help you through your recovery every step of the way. Every step of the way. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. You know, sometimes when you go through tragedy, that's when you really find out who your true friends are. Oh yeah. People who really show up for you. Yeah. And then sometimes you're surprised because the people you think are going to show up ghost you. You're like what happened well, there? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think, I think that some people, they mean well, they really do, but they themselves don't have the energy or the capacity. I, I agree. They just yeah. don't know how to show they up. Just, even though they their just heart don't. Is there. Their heart is there. And as the person who's going through that trauma, we have to look at that and go, they're doing what they can do. Like we have to accept whatever it is they get. If all they give us is a phone, phone call, call, text, a text, mm -hmm. that's what they, it doesn't mean anything. The worst thing, and I think this is how people sink deeper and deeper into PTSD. The worst thing that you can do is start assigning value or in meaning to someone else's actions. I agree totally. I agree totally. Yeah. And also, I, I also found in, in different times of crisis for me, I'd be comforting them. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. <laughs> oh my God, yes. That's a big one. That's why when I was in the hospital, I was like, just get out of here. Like, I don't want anybody here. Bye, go. Because I felt like I had to entertain them. Oh, gosh. I felt like I had to. Yeah, it's exhausting. It was just like, are you okay? Are you hungry? Do you, you know, do you need? And they're just like, you know, I'm over here like in pain trying to fake that I'm not hurting. Right? Not to I'm throw trying to throw up on the pain meds yes, in front to, of everyone. Oh, my God. Trying to look oh cool. Try <laughs> you know, it's funny how we go through these really traumatic experiences. And then we realize that we just need to allow ourselves to be ourselves, mm -hmm. you know? Cause you sound like me, you know, in, in that, even in really difficult times, you're still trying to hold it together <laughs> and show up for everybody, you know? And, and sometimes we forget that we actually need to show up for ourselves first. You know what? Um, I think there's the two hardest questions anyone can ask of themselves is who am I and what do I want? They're the two most difficult questions. But when you can answer the first one, who am I? Everything else becomes so much easier. You know that if who you are is someone of character, integrity, you are your word, you are who you say you are, then you can make anything else work within your life. You know, you can make it work. It becomes workable as long as you know who you are. And um, that's one of your gifts is, is helping people tap into that secret power and find out who they are. Yeah. yeah and yeah. then by, by doing that, you're able to, once they, once they embrace that and own that, what they're capable of expands just oh a thousand fold. And it's, it's like you unlock something magical within them, which is their own magic. Yes. Yes. You should see the light when the light goes on in someone and they realize like, oh, this is like what it's always been about. Like, this is who I am. This is how, you know, and I don't have to be this person that I've been pretending to be. Like that moment, it's, it's so magical. It's yeah, huge. Yeah. Because most people are being someone based on a past experience. Their whole life is predicated on what somebody said to them that, with or, me. or family expectation, you oh, know, we're yes. programmed from such an early age to show yes. up a certain way, you behave yes. a certain way, you pursue a career because your parents tell you this is, this is a, a good way to go. This is, this is going to give you security and comfort. And we're not programmed or encouraged to find our own divine spark and, and passion and follow that. It's always 
it's always a game of navigating who we are versus yeah. who we're supposed to be. And then the guilt that comes with not being who we're expected to be, you know, and maybe oh, yeah. it takes courage to, to step out of your, uh, you know, the, the pack. That bubble, right? That it takes bubble. a huge amount of courage and it's like, it's almost like sometimes cutting off a piece of yourself. Because if you come from a family where the matriarch makes all the decisions and then you say, I'm not doing that, you could literally be cut off from your lifeline, like everything. So you can, you, can, you lose yeah. people when you find yourself. Exactly. And that's, <laughs> and sometimes that's not a bad thing. No, you know? it isn't, but it's painful <laughs> all the same. Yes, it is. To question people outside of you. People who are separate from you start that that are used to you showing up for them and meeting their agendas. They don't like it when you start to find out who you are. Nope. Whether that's a spouse or a parent <laughs> or a family member or a friend, there's this uh, judgment. And you have to have so much courage, I think, especially as women. We're so used to being in service and showing up and being making sure everybody's okay and we're doing what everybody expects us to do. It takes so much courage for us to really stand in our power and say, no, this is my path and this is who I am. Well, speaking of judgment and being a woman, um, when I decided I was going to run for Congress, that was definitely my biggest fear, was the fear of being judged and not being seen for the person that I really am and being seen as some title, right? Or whatever label that whoever it is wanted to give me. That was my biggest fear. And um, had I let that fear control my decisions, I would have never run, I would have never learned what I've learned or met the people I've met or even been able to make a difference in the way that I have. Um, and so I'm thankful that I don't, I don't let what other people say about me or think about me you know, dictate my decisions I in life. I love that. I love that. What inspired you to run for Congress? That was a bold undertaking. And I admire you so much for just throwing <laughs> your name in the hat and going for it. What What was the catalyst? And what was that conversation like with your husband? So, <laughs> thinking, <laughs> I'm going to throw this on. I'm going to throw this into the mix. So, this is what was going on. Um, Earlier this year, my husband and I decided that we were going to move to the Philippines next year. And we were going to move for one full year. We were going to stay in the Philippines. That's where my husband's from, the Philippines. Okay. And um, so I had been working, you know, in my business and preparing for this move. And so I was going to retire from my business. Um, we were going to move to the Philippines next year, you know, kick it on the beach for a while, have a great time, and then come back. Well. I had reached the point where I was ready to retire. So this was in September. So I had, you know, saved up enough money. Everything was going well. I'm going to retire from my business. I had finished the last project. I had closed everything with the last client and um, I had shut my computer, gotten my PJs, crawled in the bed and was watching TV. And my, I was watching like a few episodes of, um, don't worry about the show. <laughs> It's called Watchmen, but anyway, I was watching these episodes, okay. and um, and so everything was really good. And then later that night, about four hours later, I got a phone call from one of my good friends, and she said, Pete Olson has just announced that he's not going to run for re-election. He is retiring as congressman of District 22. And I was like, okay, what's that got to do with me? <laughs> and she was like, are you kidding? You'll be perfect. You have got to run. This is your chance. You've got to do this. We need you. We need you. And so anytime somebody goes, we need you, I can't say no. I can't your attention. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, oh, well, how am I going to say no? They need me, right? And so I was retired all of four hours. <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine the look on your husband's face. Hey, honey, change of plans. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. So I tell my husband, I was like, um, I, I, I think I'm going to run for Congress. What do you think about that? And he was like, uh, 
no, don't, don't do that. And I was like, why, why don't you want me to run for Congress? And he goes, because it's going to be a lot of pressure on you. You're going to put that pressure on me. <laughs> There's a spillover effect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so um, some time passed and I said, well, let me just test the waters a little bit. Let me see. And so as I was testing the waters, I was getting amazing feedback. I mean, just a lot. And so my husband was like, you've got to do this. You, you have to do this. And so he was, he was all in and I was like, okay, here I we go. I know, I mean, <laughs> what to do. I wouldn't even know like the first steps. Obviously fundraising is huge because you need to fund your campaign. But oh God. how do you, is there like some sort of playbook that you <laughs> access? You know what? I may write that playbook as soon as I figure it out. Because <laughs> <laughs> gosh, I, that's such a huge, for somebody who hasn't been in a political arena, obviously you were, you know, you sort of exposed to politics in your military career, but this right. is a really different kind of game. This is, this is different in that, um, you know, there are some rules to, that are being some, some rules in this game that's being played that I was not privy to. Like I didn't, I really did not expect. Um, so how do you do it? I can't answer that question. I can say that if you're going to do it, there's going to be a whole ton of reasons why you shouldn't. People are going to give you, <laughs> it's kind of like oh, this isn't by fire. It is. It is. All there's, right, jump in. There are so many rational reasons why you should stay away, like far, far away. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's this one reason that trumps them all that says, do it, like go for it. And that one reason is that you can make a difference. That you, that you as one person can actually influence the lives of people that you care about that people that are in your community and around you. And that one thing gives you all the hope in the world. And you're just like, I'm not listening to none of that. You're just like batting it. out all the negative stuff. You're like, I, I can do that. This. You held on to that principle because that renews my faith in humanity. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you, you we're so jaded by the way public, the, the politics plays out in the public and the press. And, and it's, yeah. it's such a circus. You know, it's so it interesting is. to know that there are people like you who really want to make a difference and you have the heart and you have the soul um, and truth behind running. It's not yeah. just for power. No, it's not just for power. It's not for power at all unless you are saying it's the power to create something. Um, mm -hmm. That's what really drives me is this power to create something that's never been done or said or believe like this newness of it like drives me every day what did you learn about yourself through this process oh what did i learn you know i haven't even had a chance to really download that um right. you've been in it for i've been in it yeah um but thinking about it now i think that i've i've learned that i have a charisma <laughs> i would say that's true um, <laughs> I, I do. I think I have a charisma that people are attracted to and that that's enough to get my foot in the door, but it's not enough to get the seat at the dinner table. I think that you've got to do a lot more and, and people believe, some people believe that it's enough to be Instagrammable. Okay, for lack of a better term, right? It's enough that you look pretty or it's enough that you speak well or it's enough that you're smart and all of these things are great attributes, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's not enough to it get- It feels like you almost table. have to have all those qualities, but then you also have to have a machine behind you who yes. can drive, drive you to the forefront. You do, you do. You can be the most amazing person, but you, like you said, you need that, that machine behind you. That's it, it's the, it's the wheels that's turning in the rooms that you're not in. Mm -hmm. um, that's where these deals are getting made. You know, like I said, I come from a background where I was always in the room and now I'm not. And so um, these deals are getting made and it's similar to betting on a horse, a horse race where they go, Let's see, I've got, I've got X number of dollars. I can put some on this horse. I can put some on that horse. It's the same thing. I can put some on this 
candidate or that candidate, but I'm only going to put it on the candidates that I believe are actually going to win. And how they come up with that, um, that, that formula of who's going to win is solely based on dollars raised. It has nothing to do with character or integrity, unfortunately. It has but nothing to do with all of that. We are in the situation we're in. in Absolutely. Yes. Know, right? yes. <laughs> Just profile a person who can bring, bring the dollars in, but it's make who can bring the dollars. Necessarily bringing the heart and the exactly. and the, and the We space. would hope. We would hope that you could do both. That we can have someone that could do both. And I think that there is at least one person in this race who's still in this, in my particular race, that can do both. I, I, I believe that there is one. Um, however, it's, it's so rare that you get to see for real, like someone's real heart when it comes to politics, because politics will tarnish you quickly. Oh my gosh, they'll, they'll oh, yeah. flesh from your bones. You show one ounce of vulnerability, you're going down. Yes. You're going down hard. You're, you got a knife in your back so fast. <sighs> Oh, wow. It, it's, all, it's a constant looking over your shoulder, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yes. About thick skin, I would think, because there's going Absol- to be yes. critics as part of the game, right? Yes. Yes. There's, go- there's definitely going to be critics. You can expect that um, in politics. But think about that. I mean, there's, it doesn't matter what you do. I just admire you for throwing your name in the hat and getting this far. So congratulations, Kelly. Thank you. Thank You're a you. winner in my that. book. And, <laughs> Thank you. and who knows, you know? You, you never know if another opportunity will cycle around. You're always, you know, older and wiser. That's right. Second time around. And, and what you, <laughs> just think about what you have inspired in your children. Yes. You have three beautiful, three beautiful sons. children. Are they sons? Three boys? Sons. I've got three boys. Well, they're not boys. So you know, <laughs> I've got, <laughs> one is 24 years old. He's a man. <laughs> And I've got a 13 and a 14 year old. Oh, okay. So they're very, the 13 and 14 are still very impressionable. Oh, right? they are. And they're, you're leadership yeah. and willing to take risks and to, to take on these challenges. You're modeling something for them, whether they're saying it or not. Um, just watching you in the trenches and seeing what it's taking for you to, you know, navigate this process. And then the conversation you're having around the dinner table about your day, it's not a typical ordinary day where someone went to the office, they clocked in, they sat in a cube and they came home, you know, you're, you're actually doing something that hasn't ever been done in your family before. That's right. So it's pretty exciting. And I, I love that. (laughs) I'm sure you're creating huge impacts on them just by being you. I believe that I am. I believe that I am. And, and, um, you know, for, for, for all the moms who are listening right now, you know, sometimes your kids act like they're not listening. They, they act like they don't care. That's, you know, you're just, yeah, you're just mom, whatever. But um, there will be a day when they come back and they, get, they, or they say something or do something you thought they never saw you do or say. And, uh, and you're like, oh, they were paying attention. And I think that's like the moments we live for as moms. I would say there's something very humbling. I have two, two sons, 27 and 25. There's, there's nothing more humbling than having kids because you could be like the CEO of a company and come home and they'd be like, I told you I didn't want taquitos for dinner. <laughs> they like bring you right back down to earth. Like, you know, <laughs> they will oh, yeah. you so quick. <laughs> Absolutely. You're at home. Like, do you even know who I am? Do you know what I do for a living? Exactly. Oh, yeah. I change people's lives, you guys. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, so true. I mean, I used to come home <laughs> to my, my oldest son, and he would just be like, you know, not even knowing what I'd done that day. Like, I was sitting with like leaders of Thailand, um, Australia, leaders of uh, <laughs> Japan, where, you know, all this stuff, right? And I come home, and he goes, Mom you forgot to put the chips in my lunch again. <laughs> Keeping it real, man. Okay. <laughs> they keep you humble. You're like, all right, all right. I could have done yeah. that. I forgot the chips. Like, I'm, I'm sorry. I, you know what? I will put two chips in there. <laughs> <laughs> you can have an extra Twinkie. <laughs> right, right. So we just do the best that we can. You know, we do the best I'm that we can. You. Oh, yeah. Humbling, for sure. 
for sure. <laughs> so were your, what was your husband doing um, while you were navigating all of this? I mean, you've had a full plate. I'm sure he's had to show up um, on the domestic front to help you with the kids while you've been working all your magic. My husband is amazing. I mean, he's, I'm, I'm going to go way back for you just a little bit. So, <laughs> so we met each other in Okinawa, Japan. He's Filipino. He was there just visiting some family members and um, they had a little party and they, for him, you know, visiting Okinawa and I was invited and uh, turns out that that whole party was just a setup to get us together. Are you serious? <laughs> and it worked. The whole, the whole thing was just, yeah. It totally and we've been worked. married, we've been married 14 years. Wow. So, um, so when my son Nathaniel was born, he's the youngest. When Nathaniel was born, I mean, I was busy doing everything. Like I was deployed a lot, like everything. My husband, I did not have to change a diaper. I did not give a bath. I, I, not, my husband literally did everything. When Nathaniel would cry, he would dance with him and Nathaniel Showed would up. stop crying. Time. Just you know, then I, I deployed and he would make sure that we were seeing each other on, you know, video so I could, you know, see the baby. And I mean, just, just uh, unbelievable, unbelievable. This guy. Yeah. Awesome. And we got married. We only knew each other six months. We'd only known well, each other six months. Right away. He was the one. Well, he, I knew because I had prayed for him six months prior to that. Wow. Yeah, six months prior to that, I had I had prayed. I'd asked God to send me him. Like I was, I gave a very specific list. <laughs> and that's amazing. Yeah, and God produced exactly really what was believe, on my list in six I really months. Believe. <laughs> I was actually just creating something today, and I was I was as I was writing it, I, I actually was saying how you have to tell the universe in detail what you want to manifest and bring forth. You do. Because without that clarity, you're just throwing paint on the wall. That's right. But if you can dial it in and you can, and you can get real intentional about what you're creating and what you're wanting and real specific about how it feels and looks like and, and uh, presents, now there's something to work with, right? There's some detail. And you have to have some emotion behind it. You know, I've, I've talked to a lot of people who are like, oh, that manifestation stuff doesn't work. That's just a bunch of hooey or whatever. Oh, I believe in it 100%. Yeah, I do too. And so especially for you manifesting this incredible man. I, I strongly, I like to say your words create your world. So what you say will create the world you live in. Whatever you're saying, whether you're saying it to yourself or you're saying it out loud, it is literally creating the world that you are living in right now. Absolutely. I also, I'm an energy practitioner, so I see your energy behind your words drives. Exactly. The, it, that's what I mean by the emotion you put yeah. behind it. If you're saying, um, you know, I want to manifest $100,000, but you believe that, there's no, that that is absolutely impossible. You believe you're broke? Guess what? You're broke. That's it. <laughs> That's what's going, that's, that's the story it's the that's core. going to lead. Yeah. That, that's it. Your energetic feeling. It's your soul breathing out into the universe. And what that, what's coming from the core, that core belief, you could talk till the end of time, but it's that core belief that's really drawing to you what's resonant. That, that's right. Yeah. I agree too. I agree. I believe it too. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about your business. You, um, Word Slay Creative Agency. Mm -hmm. You have obviously a gift. You created this incredible deck. What was that deck of cards um, to help people? Yeah. Oh, let's see. Oh, do you want to see it? I do. Of course I let's do. Let's see if I have a, I have a thing with deck of cards, like how they can help you organize your thoughts. So this is actually the deck right here. Hold on a second. You're going to have to hold it up so we can all see it. So this is the deck, my Mute. pitch deck. So inside of here, this one's all beat up. I've had it around forever. <laughs> this is my personal deck. I've got all kinds of notes and stuff. It's, had some, uh, it's had some miles on it. It has some miles on it, yeah. So this is the deck here. And basically, it's all the elements of um, 
a story, a pitch, uh, a speech. Super cool. If you want to communicate, this is, these are all the elements of perfect communication. And so I have it arranged where, you know, I like to use sticky notes on the back, but there's lines on there. So if you wanted to uh, make notes or something, yeah, use a dry erase, you could do that too. Um, but, you know, like one of the elements is teaching. So if you're going to, you know, speak to a client, then you should know what do your clients need to know, right? You, and you need to be able to teach that and reinforce that with them. And so these cards just sort of guide you through how you would communicate with your clients, so um, whether you're communicating with them on stage or you're pitching an idea to someone, this is what you would use. Do you have them available on your website or how could people buy your deck? Unfortunately, they are no longer for sale. Oh, I know. <laughs> they are no longer for sale. Oh, if someone, they, it's an amazing idea actually. And um, it's, it's actually, I've seen some people uh, make versions, but mine is the original. <laughs> right. There's always that copycat version. I'm sure you're <laughs> best. It is best. <laughs> um, but you know what I would do for your listeners? If you do have a listener who, who's like, I want that deck because um, it comes with instructions. It comes with a chart that helps you organize um, a formula specific to what your, whatever your need is. Um, and it's very simple. It's really like four stages of the cards and that's it. Mm -hmm. But if one of your listeners is like, I, I really have to have it. I really need it. Then um, email me. You can email me Kelly, which is K-E-L-I. It's written right above my head over here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll drop your email address down below in the video when I edit it. Yeah, yeah. It's, find you through email. it's really easy. Kelly at kellychevalier.com. Chevalier is a lot harder to spell. It's K-E-L-I. <laughs> mm -hmm. Kelly. Yeah. But I'll, Kelly I'll drop that Kelly in. Shavalier. I'll also include your website. And so yeah. people can find you for sure if they have questions or are yeah. in um, drop me an email. You can find me on Facebook, uh, Instagram. Just put in K E L I and you'll find me. So, Kelly, what are you going to do now that you have withdrawn from this race? Now, what are you going to do with your time? Take a vacation, I hope. No time for vacation. <laughs> <laughs> You're on to your next adventure already. Let me tell you what we're doing. Um, in 10 days, we started our 10 day countdown. In 10 days, we are doing a Gumbo Masters cook-off. It is a fundraiser to raise money for the veterans who will be admitted to the VA hospital over Christmas. We are going to hand deliver care packages to them, um, blankets and pajamas and all kinds of goodies. So this Gumbo Masters cook-off, just go to Eventbrite, type in Gumbo Masters um, cook-off. You'll find all the details. So you're coordinating this effort? Yes, yes, yes. And we've already we've already raised five hundred dollars so far. Awesome. Um, our goal is um, seven thousand, <laughs> but we haven't even had the cook off yet, so we're doing right. pretty good. Right? Is it a nonprofit that you're uh, fundraising through, or is this just a one yes. kind of event? So, no, no, no. So um, the nonprofit that I founded is called um, the the Women of Arms Forces and Veterans Empowerment Campaign. So we call it the Wave Campaign for short. Okay. And um, through that nonprofit, we are raising these funds and um, we, every year we do something. We do a Christmas crawl where we go to um, recently placed homes of uh, homeless veterans. They're recently placed into permanent housing and we go to each house and we deliver a Christmas tree, um, Christmas dinner with all the trimmings, presents for the kids. So uh, we'll do up to 30 homes a year. Uh, every Christmas, but this year we're we're paying attention to the vets who are in the VA hospital. So we're gonna crawl over there. That's that. <laughs> yes. That's, I don't think you sleep. That's what I'm getting. <laughs> Conversation. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> that's beautiful. If you want to make a donation, um, how do they donate to your organization? Is is there a website? oh yeah oh yeah yeah you can just go to the way. It's T H E W A V E, the wave camp, C A M P dot com. 
thewavecamp.com and you can make Great donations account. right there on the side. Um, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna jot this down. I'm gonna yeah. edit that in. So if people want to <laughs> make a donation, that would be great. Can. Yes. That's awesome. We should all support our veterans. Yes, absolutely. Because veterans, I'm telling you, we, our veterans give so much. They never stop serving. Most veterans just, they never stop serving. They're always looking for where they can help and contribute. So well, you're a, you're yeah. a great example of that. <laughs> Chevalier. Thank you. you are definitely embodying that message. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, oh I like to do my army proud. <laughs> you do. You do for sure. I have enjoyed talking to you so much. Thank today. you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for being on the show. And let me ask you this. I always ask my guests, what is the one thing that has helped you get through those times of adversity? What has, what has, kind of helped you to navigate obviously you have a really strong inner compass and an inner um, power you know I can feel your Yoda like <laughs> magic <laughs> over here but what is the one thing that's kind of helped you like what helped you when you were going through that recovery time after that part my faith you know when you when you've gotten into those dark spaces because we all do kind of sink in once in a while even if we are the best motivational speaker in the world, we're human. So sure. maybe you can pass something on that might help somebody out there who's struggling a little bit. I think it's, I mean, it's my faith. It's my faith. And, and there were moments where I had lost faith and I basically just had to remind myself or my mother reminded me, most likely my mother reminded me mm -hmm. that all these little things, all these little trials and obstacles that you go through, are for a bigger purpose. They're all for a bigger purpose. And they, and one little thing stacks onto the next, which is getting you higher and higher and higher, closer to where you need to You're go. the building so if, blocks, right? If there's just little building blocks getting you where you need to be. Mm -hmm. And if you think of it like that, whatever you're going through, when you feel like it's um, something traumatic or it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a setback or something like that, just understand that there is a lesson in there that is preparing you for something so much greater. And that's just how I look at it every time. And it's been true. It's been absolutely true. Right? Uh, I just, I know that God wouldn't have put me through all of this for nothing. There must be something <laughs> amazing on my life. Yes. Point. <laughs> <laughs> There's gotta be a purpose. There's right? gotta be, it has to be. <laughs> Well, that's amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time. I sure honor your work, your service to our country, um, the nonprofit work you're doing. I just, I'm speechless. Thank you so <laughs> much for, for. It's a pleasure. It's, it's just my pleasure. Time. It's been wonderful my sharing pleasure. your story. And I hope that somebody out there realizes that they can achieve their dreams too. Everybody has Everyone that spark can. of greatness. Yeah. You know, you just Everyone have to can. Be yourself and, and, and thank you. And thank you for having this show because we need more of this. We need more positivity. We need uh, more people who are willing to spread joy and love and hope in the world thank you. and bring light. Um, thank you. Yes. And we need role models. So thank you for giving yes. us a stage for people to find someone, the one person that's going to resonate with them. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And even if we touch one person or five people and something that's shared gets somebody to, to shift their perspective on how mm -hmm. they're approaching their life or um, what they think is possible for them. Or we can get someone to say, hey, if that person could do it, I can do this, you know, or I can overcome, even if it's just a personal thing, like I can overcome this struggle I have with food or the story I'm clinging to that's not positive, I can let that go and maybe elevate and, and you know, create one of those building blocks we're talking about. So anyway, Kelly, it's been fantastic having you as a guest on my show. And to all my, my viewers, thank you so much for tuning in with me every week. I love y'all. Be kind to yourselves and have an amazing day. We'll see you next time. Bye.